grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mankind has always had a food problem. Historically, it's been a lack of food. For the majority of people throughout history, finding food has been a challenge, and often they have come up short. Of course, that's not how it was supposed to be. In the Garden of Eden, food was plentiful and ripe for the picking. We weren't required to earn our food with a living. Instead, it was given to us as a gift from God. But then after the fall into sin, things changed. And food only came about through hard work and toil. And for the majority of history, people have struggled to find enough to eat. But of course, that isn't our problem, is it? We tend to have a different food problem. We have an overabundance of food, and often the wrong kinds of food. Unless you are one of the very fortunate few who have an amazing metabolism, most of us have to watch very closely what we eat. And several of us deal with diets our whole lives. You and I, we live in a land of excess and overabundance. And on top of that, our new economy has many of us sitting at a desk, staring at a computer for the majority of the day. Which explains why what Jesus says in our gospel reading is often not heard. It doesn't resonate with people today. At the very end of our gospel reading, Jesus made a very bold statement. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It is a tremendous statement. It is an incredibly bold and confident statement. But in a land of overabundance, in a land of excess, his words don't resonate as well as they did 2,000 years ago. And so to better understand what exactly Jesus was saying, we really need to back up into our Old Testament reading for today. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus, and it's the familiar story of how the Israelites grumbled because they didn't have enough to eat. Now, I'll admit that the children of Israel often get a bad rap, as though they're spoiled little brats. And when they don't get what they want, they start grumbling or worshiping idols. And I'll admit that they deserve that for a good portion of Scripture. But I want you to take a look at a couple pictures. Here's the first from my latest trip to Israel. This is the wilderness of Zin. I want you to see how there is absolutely nothing there. There is no vegetation. There is no wildlife. There is no water. Take a look at the next one. This is the wilderness. You can see a small river, which is the only place that has any vegetation at all. For the vast majority of this land, it is a barren, deserted wasteland. And even with all of our modern technology, nobody lives there. This is where the Israelites camped for 40 years. This is where they lived before they conquered the promised land. And so when they start grumbling against God that there's nothing to eat, they have a legitimate concern. There's nothing there. And yet, you know, the truth is, although there was very little food or water for the Israelites, they really didn't have so much of a food problem as they had a faith problem. 
You see, the Israelites were struggling. Even in the face of overwhelming barrenness. To believe that God would still provide for his people. They had seen him bring them up out of Egypt through miracles and wonders. They had walked through the Red Sea as God had parted it. God had been with them the whole time. Over and over again, he had provided for them. And yet, they still failed to trust that he would be with them and would continue to provide everything they needed. Now God is gracious and merciful. He comes to his people. He gives them quail at night and manna during the day. He provides for their needs once again. And yet even then, he demands that they trust him. The manna that they gather in the morning, they can't store it up. Anything that sits overnight, they quickly learn is spoiled and rotten. They can't eat it. They can only gather enough manna and enough food to feed them for one day. And then they have to trust. They have to have faith that God will continue to provide for their needs. The truth is, in a very real and very literal way, they were living out what we pray each and every Sunday. Give us this day our daily bread. Not bread for a weekend. Not bread for a week. Not bread for a long five-day camping trip. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, with that in mind, you now have the background to more fully understand what happens in our gospel reading. In our gospel reading, if you remember back two weeks, we had talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he had showed that he was the greater Moses. Not only was he our good shepherd who provides and comforts us, but he was a greater Moses, feeding the 5,000 to abundance, sitting with them, eating with them, communing with them. Well, as our text for today opens up, Jesus has left that spot on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and he has returned to Capernaum, his home base. And yet the people won't leave him alone. They chase after him and their thought is, if he fed us once, maybe he'll feed us again. They were looking for a free meal. But when they find Jesus and they confront him, he turns their focus. This time, instead of getting free bread, he focuses them on their real problem, which is a trust with God. And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, he is directing them to trust that God, through Jesus, will provide for all of their needs. And yet, the people still don't get it. They hear Jesus, they understand what he says, but then they demand a sign. What will you do to prove to us that we can trust you? And you can almost hear in the text Jesus hitting his head. I just did it! You were there. I fed you in the wilderness. What greater sign do you need? Moses prayed to God. And God provided the manna and the quail. Jesus, by his own power and authority, provides for the 5,000. He did the sign. He proved to them who he was. And yet they didn't get it. 
They couldn't see it. They missed it entirely. And you know, the truth is, I often wonder if we don't do the same thing. You see, like the people of Jesus' day, we know the scriptures. They knew the scriptures too. They knew the Old Testament stories of manna in the wilderness. But you and I, we also know the New Testament stories of Jesus not only feeding the 5,000, but also feeding the 4,000 later on. We hear the stories and the wonders and the miracles. And yet, where is our trust? You know, the truth is, there's a big difference between believing and having faith. Our English language actually does us a disservice. We don't have enough words as the Hebrews and the Greeks did. Because there's a difference there. Most of our Bibles, when they talk about having faith or faithing, they simply say believing. But that's not quite right. I can go to the airport and believe that that airplane will leave from Colorado Springs and arrive in Houston at the right time and arrive safely. I can believe that. It's faith that gets me to step on that plane, to put my life in the hands of that pilot and that crew. That is faith. That is trust. And the question is, for the vast majority of us, where is our faith? Where is our trust? As we sit here in this land of excess, many of us put our faith and our trust in our bank accounts, our homes, our pension plans, and our social security. Or we don't, and we turn around and we start fretting whether we have enough or not. We tend to pray, give us this day our daily bread. But then we go out and we hoard days and weeks and months of food. We store it up in case of attack or emergency. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that good planning is a sin. It's certainly not. But in this land of excess, in this land of overabundance, where is your trust? Where is your faith? I'm not sure it's any easier for us than it was for the Israelites of the Old Testament or for the Jews sitting there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And in fact, it's probably even harder for you and me because of the excess we live in. Jesus tells us it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, for a person who lives in a land of excess and abundance and plenty to enter heaven. So where is it? Where do you put your faith? Where is your trust? And yet the truth is, even here, God comes through for us yet again. You see, Jesus in our text, he says, just believe in God. But who of us can do that? Who by our own power can believe hard enough or long enough, can concentrate so that we never waver? Just believe in God. It's a terrible burden that absolutely none of us can live up to. In fact, Luther probably put it best when he says, I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. It wasn't possible for the people of the Old Testament. It wasn't possible for the Jews at the Sea of Galilee. It's not possible 
for you and me today. If we all have to rely upon our faith that we have conjured up, then before long the tempter comes in and he starts causing doubts. Is my faith strong enough? Is it focused on the right spot? Have I done enough? The only way that you and I can have a real faith and trust in God is if he comes to us and establishes that relationship. And that is exactly what he does through holy baptism. He calls you his own. He gathers you into his hands. He places the Holy Spirit in your heart. And there he gives you that faith, that trust that he will never leave you or abandon you. And then he feeds you and he nourishes you with the very body and blood of Christ who is the bread of life. And through Christ, we have everything. My faith, it's not dependent upon my work or my effort because that often fails. But instead, it is established, it is created, and it is strengthened and maintained by Christ in his sacrifice on the cross. He guards me. He watches over me. And with him, we are safe and cared for. Now, there may be times in this life when I'm hungry. There may be times when I have to endure suffering. But it's at those times that I join with St. Paul in saying that in Christ, I can be content in all situations. He gives me all good things. And that knowledge, that is incredibly powerful. It's not just some pie-in-the-sky Pollyanna type of thinking. It is a faith and a trust and a certainty that God will never leave me or abandon me. He will keep me safe within his hands. And with him, I have absolutely nothing to fear. Because God, Jesus, who is the bread of life, will give us everything we need. You and I have a food problem. It's different than the Israelites. They didn't have enough food. We have too much. And we often have the wrong types of food. The truth is, I don't think our situation's any better. In fact, I think we're far worse off. We tend to think that if we have everything physically that we need, that we don't need God. And we turn away from him. And that, that's the real problem. It's a faith problem. It's a trust problem that God will provide for you and me. But God graciously comes to us even in this. He gives us faith. He adopts us as his own. He strengthens our faith through word and sacrament. And in the end, it never relies upon you and me, but instead it relies solely upon Jesus, the very bread of life. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. <coughs>